Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I am the Adult Program Coordinator at the North Suburban YMCA. In that role, I bring a variety of programs to adults in our community, including brain games, social networking opportunities, donation drives, and the adult education series, which you are attending today. It is my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to Illinois Bona Joint Institute's fifth virtual adult education series program with the North Suburban YMCA, entitled Management of Acute and Chronic Back Pain, hosted by physical medicine and rehabilitation physician, Dr. Mahul Garala, and physical therapist, Joe Castronovo. Dr. Garala will start off our program today and talk about the spine and what can be done to help people who are suffering from back pain, and in particular, acute back pain. Dr. Garala is double board certified, fellowship trained physician specializing in physical medicine and rehabilitation, as well as sports medicine. He also has special interests in non-operative spine management. Dr. Garala has extensive experience evaluating patients with neck and or back injuries, including fractures and comprehensively managing them through education, medication, physical therapy, and performing peripheral joint or interventional spinal injections if warranted. Once Dr. Garala finishes, physical therapist Joe Castronovo will take over. Joe is a certified manual therapist and will talk about how manual therapy is different than other types of physical therapy at IBJI. He will also discuss how the teamwork approach for patient care at IBJI, combining physical therapy with medical treatment, can lead to better outcomes for patients. Joe is the founder of the industrial rehabilitation programs at IBJI. In addition, he has helped to decrease injury rates for multiple fire, police, and public works departments in Illinois through his injury prevention program. We hope that you will gain a general understanding about managing back pain from today's presentation. Please feel free to take pictures of Dr. Garala's and Joe's slides so that you can use them as notes to refer back to at a later date. When you have questions, type them into the questions section on your screen and I will receive them and relay them to our presenters at the end of the program. If you submit a question, please know that we will do our best to answer it about 45 minutes or an hour from now. Please try to keep your questions general so that you're not sharing too much personal information with all of the attendees that we have on today's program. Thank you again for joining us today. And now please sit back, relax, and enjoy learning about managing back pain from Dr. Garala and Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Take it away, Dr. Garala. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate the lovely introduction. Um, hello, everyone out there. This is a little bit weird because this is a telemedicine um, virtual reality presentation, so I can't see the audience. Uh, but I hope are engaged and um, find the stuff that I have to talk about very useful. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is understanding low back pain and particularly the treatment options. Um, the goals of my presentation is to give you some background information about the epidemiology of back pain, go over the anatomy, talk about the assessment including imaging studies, and to uh, review the treatment uh, for back pain. And at the end of both my lecture and Joe's lecture, we can answer hopefully any questions that you might have. So back pain in itself is the reason why I'm very busy as a doctor. That 80 to 84% of the population is gonna have at least one episode of back pain in their lifetime. It also has a high recurrence rate. It can affect a quarter of the working population. And from the stats that I just disclosed, it's one of the main reasons why people go now, a lot of has been said in regards to the risk factors for back pain. A lot of times people think it um, think about the biomechanics involved in regards to physical activity. Alf Nassim was a researcher who actually put a pressure po probe into the L3 disc of a subject and had them do various postures and positions. And what they found was that sitting put more pressure on the disc than standing. If you were hunched over, you also increased the pressure. And then if you added weight, that was added force to the back. Now, this is not meaning that when you're sitting, you're going to herniate a disc, but it is a risk factor, especially if you do repetitive activities. Over time and with additional research, we found out it's more complicated than just biomechanical factors. Obviously, heavy lifting, twisting, bending all play a role but so do age, obesity, and genetic factors. 
There is also a theory in regards to the biopsychosocial component of back pain. Biology is basically the way that our tissues like muscles and ligaments adapt. Psychology is also an important factor. Uh, the pain pathways are very complex in the body. It goes from the extremities to the spinal cord into the brain, and the brain ultimately processes, processes all this information. So people that have anxiety, depression, stress at home or at work can all have um, a contributing component to their pain. And then lastly, social. People that are not happy with their jobs um, are involved in a workers' compensation claim um, can all sort of have a factor in the manifestation of the pain. Now, pain itself can be caused by numerous structures in the back. You can talk about muscles, bones, joints, discs, and nerves. Um, I would like to sort of review basic anatomy so you have a better idea of what we are talking about, especially if you go see a doctor and they use terms um, so to further your understanding. Now, the low back is also known as the lumbar spine. It is composed of five vertebrae, and then in between the vertebrae is a jelly-filled donut, the disc. The bones articulate and extend backwards, and then they form these joints at each level of the low back. So the lumbar facet joints um, are at each level on the right and left side. With the superimposed neural structures, each opening has what is called the foramen in which the nerves exit the, or the spine, I should say. Now the nerves travel from the back down to various pathways down our legs. Nerves are responsible for signals such as pain, sensation, light touch, and temperature, but it also gives signals for our motor strength. So usually when nerves are of the pain, people will complain of numbness and tingling, sometimes even weakness in their legs. The lumbar spine sits on a shelf of bone called the sacrum, which then articulates with the pelvis. The sacroiliac joint is also a potential source of pain. Usually when people have predominant buttock pain, that can be an indication that they may be symptomatic from this particular joint. Lastly, and it's very important to go over are the muscles around the spine. You hear a lot of concepts involving the core, core stabilization, core strengthening. What exactly are the core muscles? Where the muscles around the spine, but then it wraps around and the transverse abdominis muscle, the abdominal muscles itself called the rectus abdominis, and then it spans from the diaphragm, which is a muscle, all the way to our pelvic floor. So when you undergo physical therapy and they talk about core strengthening, these are the muscles that they are concentrating on. It is said that if you strengthen the guy wire, so to speak, around the spine, then you are causing more stability or stability to the spine itself. Now, I also wanted to go over a couple of particular conditions, particularly with the anatomy, in regards to a lumbar herniated disc. I get that question a lot. A herniated disc involves the disc itself, and the disc is comprised of an inner nucleus propulsus and an outer annulus fibrosis, which is basically yours. Think of it as a jelly-filled donut, and then the jelly may squirt out. That is what a herniated disc is. Based on our anatomy, right behind where that herniated disc is is where the nerve is. So you hear the term pinched nerve. So when we describe a herniated disc, it's sometimes synonymous with then creating a pinched nerve. Um, so this is basically the layman's term of sciatica. This is exactly what is going on. The other concept that I like to bring attention to is in regards to spinal stenosis. It usually impacts older patients. I went over before the foramen, and that is where the nerves exit at each level of the lumbar spine. So anything that creates narrowing, by definition, is stenosis. You can get stenosis from a herniated disc, but you can also get stenosis from arthritis, whether it's a bone spur or the joints becoming enlarged. You can also have central canal stenosis, in which the ligament flavum, which is a ligament um, in the spine, can become bigger. The joints can become bigger. And so that all leads to narrowing of the spinal canal. Now, if someone's symptomatic from foraminal stenosis, sometimes it's unilateral symptoms that they're experiencing. 
Because the nerve is being pinched, they will have symptoms traveling down the leg. However, if their condition is mainly from central canal stenosis, then they might have symptoms going down both legs. People complain of tiredness or fatigues in their, fatigue in their legs. The other sign is called a shopping cart sign where people go to grocery stores or Walmart and they actually feel better hunched over using a shopping cart. And that the reason why is from a biomechanical standpoint, you are in a flex position, which can increase the space in which those nerves can transverse. Now, when we evaluate patients, it's very important to get a thorough history from them. It can give us ideas of what the main culprit is. Um, whether it's an acute injury versus something that has been for a long period of time. Was it sudden they were bent over lifting up a heavy object? Um, what kind of things or activities, positions aggravated? As I mentioned before on one of the first slides, sitting and bending might give us a clue that it is a disc issue rather than if it's standing or walking, which may be consistent with uh, stenosis. Um, what positions make them feel better and are there associated symptoms? Do they have any symptoms traveling down the legs that might be indicative of a nerve issue? Um, so these are all important questions to ask. Now, given the COVID-19 um, pandemic, a lot of patients are concerned of leaving their house to be evaluated. And I would say this slide is very important um, because if you have any signs or symptoms as suggested, this is something that you should take heart to and, and maybe be evaluated sooner than later. In particular, if you have a history of cancer and you have significant pain at night, that might be indicative of something going on in the spine. Now, usually people that have back pain will have problems sleeping, but I'm talking about significant pain um, that keeps you up at night and you don't have as much pain during the day. In addition, if you have particular cancers like breast cancer, lung cancer, thyroid cancer, kidney or prostate cancer, those are the cancers most likely to spread to the spine. The mnemonic that I use is BLT sandwiched with a kosher pickle as a way to remember the most common cancers that usually spread to the spine. In addition, if you are immunocompromised, you are a cancer patient, you've had chemotherapy or you're on chronic steroids, you develop fever, chills, as well as low back pain. You need to be evaluated for a potential infection in the disc. Another thing to be evaluated for is progressive motor weakness. Weakness is usually caused by a nerve injury, but if you notice that the muscles in your legs become weaker and weaker, there might be a more active compression going on on that nerve that requires more urgent evaluation. And then the last thing that you should really hone in on is if you have bowel or bladder incontinence or dysfunction. It is normal for us to have some sort of urinary issues um, as we get older. Sometimes there is urinary incontinence or leakage. But what we're talking about specifically is a significant change in your bowel or bladder where you can't even control your ability to urinate or defecate. That is indicative of a condition called cauda equina syndrome, which I'll go over a little bit later in this presentation. So after we get a very good history, it's very important to do a physical exam to correlate um, the manifestation of the pain and seeing if there, it makes sense anatomically um, and see if there are clues on the physical exam. We start off with just a general inspection of the back, notice their posture. We put our hands on the patient's palpate, muscles, bones. Um, if I feel that there is pain coming from the center iliac joint, the person might have more exquisite tenderness around the buttock area. Same goes for the lower facet joints. The other important aspect is to do a thorough and complete nerve exam. As I mentioned in the anatomy section, the nerves travel down our legs in various pathways. The lumbar spine is broken down into certain segments. The L2 nerve, for instance, provides sensation in our upper thigh and it also provides strength to our hip flexors. So we can get certain ideas if there is weakness in the legs, or which nerve in particular is um, being impacted. Same thing goes for sensory testing. The nerves actually provide certain sensation in various aspects of the leg. Most people equate sciatica with symptoms going down the back of the leg which corresponds usually with the S1 nerve root. 
However, sciatica also can theoretically affect the front of the leg. There are people that come into my office with thigh pain into their knee um, that may be indicative of an L3 nerve being injured. And lastly, reflexes can give us an idea if there is a deficit coming from the back. Um, there have been a few cases where someone has come into my office with what they think is knee arthritis, but then they complain of thigh pain. And with the physical exam, that their quadricep muscles were weak, and then they had an absent patella reflex. So that actually clued me in that their symptoms were coming from the back and not necessarily the knee. We supplement the history and the physical exam with diagnostic testing. One of the first things that we typically do or order x-rays in our office. This is particular case if there's any trauma to the back, but it can give us additional information. We also are gonna review MRIs, which are excellent at evaluating soft tissue, CT scans, which provide further bony anatomy detail. And also there's a, stu a study that we can recommend called the nerve conduction EMG study, which is basically an extension of the physical and um, it can provide us ideas if there is a nerve injury, particularly to the back or not. In regards to x-rays, they are great at evaluating what we say is cortical bone, but it does not evaluate soft tissue structures. You can see on the picture on the right, it outlines the bone, but you cannot tell anything about the characteristics of the disc, the nerves, or the muscles. So you cannot tell if someone has a herniated disc on an x-ray. However, as I mentioned, it can provide certain clues in the way that a person is presenting. We should not be dismissive of young people that have back pain, especially adolescents who are very active in sports. Their bones are still susceptible to injuries and stress fractures. So sometimes x-rays can pick up subtle findings. For older adults that have arthritic changes, there can be a slippage of one bone over the other. The general term is called spondylolisthesis. This can tell us if there is a little bit of instability of the spine. When you see a spine surgeon, they will sometimes have you do what are called flexion and extension films. And what they are trying to address is the stability of this bone on top of the other. If there is of the L4 bone on top of the L5 in this particular case, it can help determine if a person would benefit from a fusion surgery. X-rays can also be helpful in evaluating someone that has a compression fracture. Compression fractures are usually um, due to weakened bones, such as osteoporosis. So if I see um, an older woman who has menopause, who has osteoporosis and comes in with acute back pain, an X-ray may be helpful at picking up if she has a compression fracture. Usually the vertebrae are all square in appearance, but you can see in this particular case, this is more wedge-shaped. So this is indicative of a compression fracture. And one of the actually the most ideal study to order, but incidentally, you can pick up some findings suggestive of a cancerous process. The bones are not always the same density, you can see it's a little bit lighter in this area. That may, again, be indicative that you have a metastatic process involving the low back. Now, I get a lot of questions in regards to lumbar spine MRIs. And as I mentioned, MRIs are great at evaluating soft tissue. However, and this is one of the most important takeaways that I would like for you guys to um, understand from this lecture, is that there is a misconception about MRIs. People think that they are pain studies when really they are not. They are anatomical studies. It is important to clinically correlate the patient's history, their physical exam with the imaging studies and see if it all points in the same direction. The reason why I say this is that the structures of the spine undergo natural changes. The disc, the bones, the joints, they do not stay the same shape and size throughout our lives. A matter of fact, bulging disc, facet joint arthritis, even stenosis are common age-related findings that will show up on the MRI. People that don't have back pain will have these findings. People with back pain will have these findings. It's similar to developing gray hair or a wrinkle. The thing is also that more common um, are these findings as we get older. There was a meta-analysis where they broke down these findings per decade. 
you can see on this graph or this table, even at the age of 30, there will be at least 50% of people that have some sort of findings involving the disc. And it becomes more prevalent as we get older in age. Now, if a physician feels that they have identified a structure to be the source of the pain, there is also not a one-to-one -one correlation between the anatomic and clinical symptoms meaning the fact that if there is a large herniated disc, that does not mean that you're supposed to have severe symptoms. There are people that have small herniated discs that have sig significant symptoms, and there are people that have very large herniated discs that really have no symptoms at all. In addition, when you see an MRI report, there is no correlation between the severity of findings. Again, when there is mention of severe arthritic changes, that does not mean people will have severe symptoms. So on this screen, you see on the left-hand side an MRI. This MRI can be indicative of someone that has no pain at all or someone that does have pain. There's no way of telling what the source of the pain is. That's why it's important in regards to the context of what the patient is presenting with to correlate the imaging study with their history and their physical exam. On the right-hand side is an analogy. The structure, the the outline is exactly the same, but depending on how you look at it, you can see either a younger woman looking behind her where this is her hair, her eyelash, her nose, her chin, or you can see this as an older person with hair, nose, and her mouth. Literally, it's the same picture, but depending on how you view it, it can represent different things. So the takeaway of this is treat the patient, not the imaging study, and I can't stress that enough because a lot of times people think an MRI is the sole determinant of finding out where exactly the pain is coming from. Now, speaking of treatment, treatment is broken down into acute pain and more chronic interventions. Acute pain is defined as anything less than four weeks. There is something called subacute pain, which is anywhere from four to 12 weeks, and chronic pain is usually pain that is around for more than three months. Acute pain is broken down into sort of five general categories, observation, medications, physical therapy, spinal injections and procedures, and surgery. Chronic pain or treatment can consist of the same acute treatment, but also includes generalized exercises, complementary and alternative medicines such as acupuncture, cognitive behavioral therapy. As I mentioned before, the brain is where pain is processed. And so with stressors in life, um, undergoing um, things that impact it, a move, COVID, that can all play a role in the manifestation of the pain and sometimes cognitive behavioral therapy or mindfulness or deep meditation can be helpful. There are chronic pain meds too that can be um, prescribed and other additional procedures that can be done from, by an interventionalist. Um, with today's lecture, I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on acute pain. The premise of observation comes from the fact that majority of low back pain improves over time. It is said that approximately 60 to 70 percent of back pain recovers in six weeks, up to 90 percent of back pain resolves in 12 weeks, and that's if you do nothing at all. So if your symptoms are minimal, tolerable, and do not lead to any functional limitation, it can be your choice to wait and see if the body will naturally heal itself. Obviously, certain types of conditions in the back lead to poorer outcomes, such as pinched nerves in the back. Um, however, that studies, studies have also shown that people can naturally improve even if they have a herniated disc. Sometimes people think that the only treatment for a herniated disc is surgery, and studies have shown that that is not the case. Usually, people can improve over time, but the frustrating fact is it takes time for herniated disc and pinched nerves to improve. It can take up to a year. However, again, studies have shown that motor deficits and sensory changes associated with pinched nerves can also improve. Even anatomically, the herniated disc can go back into place. There have been studies that if you got an MRI a year after the MRI was performed, a herniated disc can theoretically go back into place. There has been side-to-side -side comparison studies beside, between conservative care and people that underwent surgery. 
again, there is support that people can wait out their symptoms and maybe improve over time. I'm not saying that everyone should do that. There are certain conditions that in which surgery is absolutely indicated, but there is no rush for people to undergo surgery in most cases. A lot of times we advise our patients to modify their activities. There is no definitive position or posture that we can advise them to always do that will prevent pain. We do want them to avoid bed rest. Studies have shown that if you are just confined, if you just confine yourself to the bed or the sofa, that actually slows down the healing process. When it comes to um, sleeping at night, it's really just finding a position of comfort. There has been no stringent studies that have said the type of mattress that you sleep on is, is better than the other. So really it's just a position of comfort, um, whatever that may be to help you. We usually augment treatment in the form of medications, usually for more severe episodes of pain. The aim of medications is to help reduce or eliminate inflammation. We usually do this by two means. One is prescribing a Medrol dose pack. The second thing is prescribing a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication. Medrol dose packs are steroids that are prescribed over the course of six days. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications can be prescribed over-the-counter like ibuprofen or Aleve or prescription strength. The thing is, is anytime you think you need to take a medication, I would still advise you to touch base with a doctor because there are some contraindications. Both Medrol dose pack and non anti-inflammatory medications can upset the stomach lining. Medrol dose packs can increase blood sugar. So if you do have uncontrolled diabetes, that might be a concern. Non-steroid anti-inflammatory medications can also theoretically increase the risk of a heart attack or a stroke. People that have long-standing history of coronary artery disease or are on blood thinners um, are actually typically, typically recommended not to take these medications by cardiologists. Patients can also consider other medications like acetaminophen or Tylenol. Muscle relaxants, which I typically prescribe, um, as a sleep adjunct, if people have problems sleeping at night, sometimes cyclobenzaprine can help cause sedation. This too also has potential side effects. Um, opioids, nerve stabilizers, and medical marijuana are also um, medications that can be prescribed but are usually for chronic pain um, patients. Physical therapy, which uh, Joe will go into a little bit more detail, is another intervention that can help. As I mentioned, the core muscles are very important um, to stabilize the spine. So in order to optimize the health of the spine, you need to optimize the health of the muscles. The thing that I wanna sort of chime in on is that bodies are not built the same. There are genetic factors, there are different postures, muscle strength that are very different between people. So there is not a cookie cutter program that will benefit every person. Um, I understand sometimes people do not want to go out, especially in regards to the pandemic, but it's very difficult to do give home exercises just to um, any person without having the individual detail that is truly needed. Spinal injections. Spinal injections can help with pain. Um, however, as I just mentioned, pain can be difficult to pinpoint and treat. It's not simply, I hurt here, please put a needle here and inject this area. The analogy I use is someone that has a heart attack goes to the emergency room. The heart is located in the left chest, but sometimes people come in with jaw pain or pain down their arm. So if the patient says, doctor, I need an injection in my jaw because that hurts or my arm because that hurts, they are completely missing the structure for the issues to begin with, which is the heart. So it's the same concept and principle that needs to be um, adhered to when we're talking about spine pain. You need to inject the structure responsible for the pain. And so what you do is you correlate. You look at the patient's history, their physical exam, and look at their imaging study and see based on putting the whole picture together if you can identify a source of pain. Now, when performing spinal injections, you also have to keep in mind that it is specific to one target area. There is no one injection that helps with all pain. People might not understand, um, and I'm actually surprised when I discuss this with patients, that there are numerous injections that can be performed in the back. 
The most common is an epidural steroid injection. Epidural is simply the name of the space in which you are injecting around the spinal cord and around the nerve. There are actually three types of epidural steroid injections that can be performed. You can perform a transforaminal, which is off to the side, an interlaminar, which is a more a direct posterior approach, or a caudal injection, which is from below. All of them have their own advantages and disadvantages, but again, there are three different types of epidurals that can be performed. There are other injections that can be targeting the joints of the back called the facet joints. You can perform an injection to the sacroiliac joint, and there are actually injections targeting the small nerves that supply the facet joints with sensation. This potentially can lead to a procedure called radiofrequency ablation. So there are numerous injections that can be performed to the back. All of them require a special type of x-ray machine called a fluoroscope. This allows you to rotate the x-ray around the patient's body in which the patient is usually facing down on a table. We generate x-rays to help guide the needle where it needs to go. And for this particular slide, this is an example of an interlaminar epidural steroid injection at the L5-S1 level. The needle is introduced and is advanced slowly to this space. We use a different angle to the side to appreciate the depth of the needle. So you it takes a lot of skill and a lot of times fellowship training to understand the different aspects in which the images are generated to know safely where the needle needs to go and where it shouldn't need to go. But this is a generally good area for the needle to be in. One way to verify that the needle is in the right spot is then to inject dye, which can give us a good outline of where the medication is eventually gonna go. So this is actually indicative of a good epidural spread. And based on that confirmation, we then inject a steroid solution. So a few takeaway points from injections is that unfortunately they're not usually walk-in procedures. People that come into our ortho access clinic with shoulder and knee pain, sometimes they get injections that same day, but unfortunately the same doesn't go for spine injections. The reason why it is considered an advanced procedure. It requires a C-arm or a fluoroscope. You need to reserve the room as well as an X-ray tech to help perform the injection. You need insurance approval before usually proceeding with these injections. These injections serve pain relief purposes. It can aid in the healing process, but the other thing is, is that responses are variable. What works for one person or your friend may not work for you. It all depends on the potential source of the pain. These injections and procedures can be repeated. There are no strict guidelines on the limits. However, one thing to keep in mind is if these injections are losing their efficacy, maybe it's time to reevaluate and see if there's any other potential treatment that the patient may benefit from. The last topic I want to address is surgery. Now, there are indications in which surgery can be helpful. Usually when people fail concerted treatment, such as modifying their activities, taking medications, undergoing physical therapy, and in a lot of times undergoing injections, if someone still has pain, then sometimes surgery is indicated. Another possible indication is someone that has significant functional limitations. Let's say someone is the sole breadwinner of the family, works in a very high demanding job requiring lifting. Maybe they can't afford taking up to a year um, or up to a year off or restricting their activities for their body to heal itself. Maybe they need a more an acute interventions such as surgery. The other thing is that progressive neurological deficits, um, as I mentioned before, if the leg all of a sudden becomes weaker and weaker, that might be indicative of a more compressive lesion. Maybe surgery is needed in that situation. But the most important indication for surgery, and this is literally the only mandatory condition, is cauda equina syndrome. Um, patients always ask and are concerned, do I need to go to the hospital for my back pain or symptoms going down the leg? The answer to that question is in regards to, do you have symptoms consistent with cauda equina syndrome? This is an imaging study based on an MRI of someone that has cauda equina syndrome. 
And that is if a bunch of nerves in the back are being compressed. And it can either be compressed from a very large herniated disc as demonstrated on this imaging study, or it can be due to significant stenosis. In any regards, it's a constellation of symptoms that the person usually has. Again, bowel and bladder disturbances are usually noticed. People might have weakness in both their legs. They also might have saddle anesthesia, which is basically when they're sitting on the toilet, they go to wipe themselves and they can't feel that area. So in this situation, if someone has majority of these symptoms, I urge them to go immediately to the emergency room because that is the only indication which surgery has been found to help be helpful. You cannot treat cauda equina syndrome conservatively. So my take home points from this overall lecture is that back pain is extremely common. It's not just related to activity. Majority of back pain can improve over time and herniated discs are very common, even for asymptomatic and symptomatic people. MRI findings are usually age related. They are not anatomical, or I'm sorry, they are anatomical studies, not pain studies. And that concerted treatment is an option for almost all cases of low back pain. Thank you for taking the time of your day to um, join us today. I am going to hand it off to Joe. Thank you, everyone. My name is Joe Kashnobel. i um, been a physical therapist, been with Illinois Bone Joint for about 17 years. Um, the MTC in my name, that stands for Certified Manual Therapist. I've received this through the University of St. Augustine. Um, there's a lot of certifications out there. This is a difficult one to achieve. Um, you may see physical therapists in acute care, uh, neuro, neuro care, stroke patients, um, spinal cord injuries. But in the orthopedic sense, um, I'm a manual therapist and treat that, that's just for spine, but for all types of injuries, including shoulder, foot and ankle, um, knees, hips. So when you think of physical therapy, I guess it depends on your experience with physical therapy. It's come a long way and even so much in recent years. And then many people think about physical therapists as maybe a glamorous uh, personal trainer, right? So you're gonna give you exercises and that's probably true, but maybe not right away. So sometimes we need to get that pain down, get that motion going, and then we're gonna give you exercises. So you walk into the, see Dr. Garal in the back clinic and you're in so much pain, you, the thought of going over to see the physical therapist right there and then is what you know we try to achieve and have same day treatment is not in your comprehension because you're like, Are you crazy? I'm not going to do these exercises. I can't even move. So this is not what you're going to get when you walk in the first day. You're going to get um, a, a probably different experience than you're used to. I might give you a few things to get started and get moving, but I've actually had people um, over the last year who so debilitated can't even stand straight can barely walk in the door and they walk out of that door the same the same day 50 percent better some people think of physical therapy as this passive thing and maybe they've had in the past and the therapist gave them ultrasound electrical stimulation uh, hot packs didn't help much might have felt good while it was on but it didn't really help the situation and and you you're probably not gonna get that, or at least where we're at. So I think a lot of people use these things to maybe have something else to bill insurance for. And if you're extreme pain, yeah, maybe I'm gonna put a electrical stimulation on to try to calm things down, but really that's not what physical therapy is about right now. And that's shown much in the research. So you think of this when you go to physical therapy, um, a few of my patients think of this when they come to physical therapy. I'm Physical therapy is not the spa treatment. Um, you're not there to just get a massage and go home. There is some work involved. Um, so this is not what to expect when you come in the door. Um, many people think of physical therapy as pain and torture. And I guess it depends on your experience. You had a frozen shoulder, maybe a knee replacement that had some complications, a little stiff. Yeah, it's gonna be a little bit of a pain and torture session but physical therapy shouldn't be overall painful. Sometimes we got to push a little bit to get things moving, but overall you're going to come out feeling less pain and feel better as a whole. 
So which one of these is an early physical therapy intervention, right? So, you know, physical therapists, as we know today, started after World War I when the soldiers came back and they had some amputations and going back to the polio epidemic and some nurses would help with certain muscle weakness and walking. But really the thought of manual therapy, mobilizing a joint goes back to ancient Greece. Um, so it's something that's been around a long time. So the picture on your left is not physical therapy, it is the Spanish Inquisition. But the picture on your right is actually what, what they call bone setters, where this is an actual contraption where they would try to push back or set a bone in someone's back causing back pain. So that is not what you're gonna get. I'm trying to patent that myself, but um, this is not what you're gonna get. I do this with my hands. But again, going back a long time, the idea of resetting a bone is there for improved pain and function. So this is what I think of when you think of physical therapy, right? So we are using our hands to improve tissue function, joint function, to help with pain, to help you go on with your life, get rid of, not get to the chronic stage of pain and get moving. And then this is gonna help you do your exercises better. So this is what you would think of as modern day physical therapy when it comes to the spine. So as Dr. Grau was saying, low back pain, I think he had up to 80%. This might be getting old research. Many people have back pain over their lifetime. Um, often gets better on its own, but sometimes we don't wanna go 12 weeks with constant pain. We wanna speed up that process and we're there to help you do that. As Dr. Grau said, you know, we have the spinal column, we got cervical, spinal vertebrae, thoracic, lumbar, the sacrum cossacks fuse at the bottom, and they're all, they serve different purposes. They eliminate motion in certain directions. Uh, the hold kind of acts like a spring for, um, for good posture, supporting your spinal column. And this is something we look as a whole. So we're looking at the patient as a whole with the posture as we go throughout their evaluation. Um, Back to the disc, a lot of people think back pain, disc pain. I couldn't agree with Dr. Grau more that, you know, the MRI is for anatomical studies, not for pain. So I see patients come in, of course, not from Dr. Garala, but some primary care, and they got this MRI and all these fancy words and degeneration and moderate degeneration, this and that, and moderate bulge. And I say, who cares? Because there's lots of different types of herniations. You could have a bad herniation, this is just a bulge. Then you have a protrusion. Uh, so this one's sequestered, actually broken out in space. And you could have a little pain with a small one or no pain with a big one. So it really doesn't matter. Um, this is a little different take on it. Yeah, so your, your spine starts to degenerate as early as 30 years old. That's why people get shorter as they get older because there's less water, less space in their disc. Um, but if you took a summary of a group of 45 year olds with no significant low back pain in their lifetime, 38% would have some kind of bulge, 29% would have protrusions, 10% excursions, and 0% would have those more severe break off pieces floating around. So just because you have a bulge in your MRI does not mean that's where your pain's coming from. So I always reiterate to my patients pain be coming from those other structures that. Dr. Grawl just talked about. So uh, as you get older, you get degeneration, you get less water in there, so it's less white, you get a little, less, little more narrowing. And again, normal age, part of the aging process. So why have manual therapy? So what we're doing as a manual therapist, you have pain, you have causes inflammation, causes stiffness. And actually it causes muscle weakness as well. So with the manual therapy, we're trying to restore proper joint mechanics. Are the vertebrae moving properly and, and pondering each other? Um, by mobilizing the joint, we're increasing nutrition. So the disc doesn't have a direct blood supply, especially as you get older. So we're trying to push nutrients into the disc and aid with the healing, and which also improves chemical balance of the tissue, not just the disc, but the soft tissue around it by 
Doing this, we're also reducing inflammation. We're elongating the muscle fibers and, uh, and the ligaments and the soft tissue, so you're relieving pressure on the disc area. You're improving the body's tolerance to insult. What does that mean? So if your joint spine, your facet joints are moving properly and you move, you're not causing more stress to the system. And by just touching and mobilizing, we're gaining pain, meaning you're tricking your brain into thinking there's less pain there and getting you out of that pain pattern um, naturally. So if you think about manipulation, what is a manipulation? So in, in physical therapy, it's any skilled controlled motion of the spine, of the vertebrae, of a joint. But if you think of a, like a chiropractic manipulation, we're getting a pop, right? You're getting that crack. All that is is a, a synovial fluid and a, a release of a gas that causes the joints to make a pop. Um, so if you crack your knuckles, it's the same thing as if you were cracking your neck or, or cracking your, someone was cracking your spine for you. Sometimes you get that when you're just stretching on your own. That's completely fine. So again, a certain amount of tension, it's often done with a skilled set of motions to improve mechanics of the joint. So a pop usually is a high velocity, short amplitude mobilization of the spine. Um, if you don't get a pop, doesn't mean you're not doing anything, you can, which is the take home point here. You're still helping with the motion, even if you don't get the pop, but the pop gives us a sense of, uh, accomplishment that, Hey, I'm do I'm definitely doing something. I'm doing something quicker and hopefully making the patient feel better. Um, so high velocity, low amplitude manipulation. So what does that mean? Again, you're isolating a joint to open it up, generally it's the facet joints along the spine that make that noise when you get the pop. There's different techniques out there. Um, the lumbar one, very common. Cervical is a whole different world. There's vertebral arteries and more nerves and sensors in the neck area, and you have to be extra careful on the neck. So cracking the neck for no reason because your back hurts, something we don't recommend we want to make sure the neck's moving properly we have like cervical radiculopathy and moving but it's even a more difficult skill and make sure you go to someone that trust you trust to do that self-manipulation right so some people are chronic manipulators they're always doing this to their neck because it feels better but the general the more you do this the more you need to do this so anyone who wants to manipulate you professionally it's not something you, we recommend doing as an ongoing process. It's something because the more you do it, you're making the joint more mobile. And the more you need more mobile, the joint is the more you need to do the manipulation. You know, again, you can also hurt yourself, cause nerve problems or even strokes with certain manipulations by someone or yourself. So I was saying the cervical spine, you have the facet joints along the side. There's these other joints along here as well that can cause this manipulation. There's a lot more going on here than the lumbar spine. There's more motion, more mobility, so therefore more easy, you can damage other tissue where the lumbar spines are bigger and more stable. Um, but then again, why manual therapy? Could you, could you achieve the goal with just exercise and in some cases yes but in many cases it's going to take maybe a lot longer if you're so stiff you're not moving um, exercise is going to be harder to do less intensive and it's going to take a lot longer time period to get those joints moving so most research in the medical field is focused on the use of exercise alone versus use of manual therapy and exercise together in almost every case manual therapy with exercise is more effective in treating pain stiffness than exercise alone um, I think some people are also more mobile. Um, so like Dr. Grau said, there's different body sites. If you're the stiffer, stockier type body type, you might need a little extra help that you can't get to the, what you need to do with exercise alone. So it was, was pointing out earlier, those facet joints, um, that's where the pop comes from. But then pick, and there's the nerve root, but then picture you're starting to get degeneration here. Now these facet joints are getting more impacted and they can be, um, 
arthritic inflamed too. So the more of these discs shrink, the more compression you're going to be getting on the facet joint as well. Now there's passive stability. There's lots of ligaments along the spine for stability. And those could be sources of pain as well. Um, they could be sprained just like you're spraining an ankle ligament. But as you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So you're not having a displaced bone. You're, you can have in the lumbar spine, you can have a spondylolisthesis where the whole vertebrae goes forward. But in some professionals feel there's like the bone is out of place. The bone's never generally out of place. It just gets stiff, stuck in this facet joint area. And then the manual therapy will help improve the motion. Uh, the sacroiliac joint, as Dr. Grellis just showed, you know, it's the place of injection, it's a source of pain. So before I forget this, step back, the facet joint is a source of pain. The ligaments are a source of pain. Uh, but, and the SI joint is often referred to the buttock area. But a lot of all of those structures can also refer pain into the lateral leg anterior leg, posterior, you know, even to the posterior thigh, generally above the knee. So sciatic pain, nerve pain, it is often with pain down the back of the leg. And there's ways of testing that to make sure it is the sciatic nerve. But often, especially if you get referral from a primary care doctor that it's sciatica, well, really it's just referred pain from that area. So don't mix up pain in the leg as purely always sciatic nerve pain. Okay, so go back to sacroiliac joint. Uh, some health professionals, doctors, physical therapists even, don't address this issue. And I think it's actually a major problem in the part of the population. There's different body types, there's different uh, lifestyles. So if you were a certain body type and you were a gymnast and when you were younger and you had three children, you're gonna have a lot more motion in the sacroiliac joint. And often there's like an anterior posterior rotation in this, which would cause a cascade of problems. If you already have degeneration in the spine and arthritis, and this is off, you're gonna aggravate and make this more stenotic, narrowing the, the joint out here. So until you normalize this position of the, of, of the uh, SI joint, you're not going to improve above in the lumbar spine. And also I've seen where the SI joint I think is have a, a fault or out of position and you're causing problems in your knee or your hip, um, in your groin area, because your whole chain is off and it actually causes a false leg length discrepancy. So a skilled therapist to, man, to help align that pelvis will help could possibly help multiple the problems. Again, maybe not everyone, but there's certain people out there Well, this problem will be more of an issue than others. So mentioned chiropractors versus physical therapists. So a lot of people think I'm gonna get manipulated, I'm gonna go to the chiropractor. Um, and all physical therapists, especially coming out of school in the last 10 years have had a much heavier dose of manual therapy and higher level manipulation. So I went to St. Augustine as a, a, a tertiary education, I guess, for the post-physical therapy for my manual therapy certification. There's lots of uh, different programs out there and internships for physical therapy. But to compare us, you know, we're both doctors of some sort most of the time, I think. And again, I don't want to put down the chiropractic practice because there, there's good and bad out there in any profession. I'm known of some very good chiropractors out there that can be helpful. Um, it's a different philosophy um, as a whole. Some things I disagree with, depending on what school that chiropractor is coming from. But we're both doctors. We, as a physical therapist, we treat the person as a whole. Uh, we're skilled in manual therapy. Um, you could say chiropractor is as well, but they have different techniques. And I think some of the cervical techniques should be, gone, should be approached with some caution. Uh, the chiropractors treat the spine as all sources of pain and, and nerve energy flow. And certain schools of thought where if you 
correct the spine, um, they're fixing everything um, to include disease. That's never been proven in research. Um, so if you have low back pain, they may crack your neck to help the low back pain. And again, that has not been um, verified in research as well. Uh, we both can come to us directly. I do believe physical therapy in, in many cases are safer in their manual techniques. Um, we kind of teach self-reliance versus the traditional chiropractic of this is kind of a maintenance of life that you want you to keep coming back. So we would hope you come in for some sessions and we would get you back to normal and you're going to be able to manage your pain on your own and not require us. And sometimes it requires a tune up years down the road, but hopefully we do is teach it yourself. You know, we don't prescribe medicine, neither do uh, chiropractors. Uh, we don't prescribe x-rays and they do, but there's also a thing of why we don't need to, to do x-rays. If the doctor thinks there's an x-ray needed, they do the x-ray. We analyze motion and joint mobility and spacing with our hands. So there's really not a need if, if, in our case for the use of x-rays. So now if you take the relationship of an ill and bone joint where we have, you're seeing the doctor and he's managing your pain and medication if needed. And now you have us working together as a team. I think you have a much better uh, therapeutic outcome than the other. So yeah, so physical therapists, we are often doctors of physical therapy now, three years post graduate program with many different levels of uh, certifications and residency programs available. So I mentioned we are uh, therapeutic alliance, not reliance. We don't want you coming to us forever. We want you to be able to manage this back pain on your own. So why do we do exercises? I'm not sure that. Uh, stronger muscles to support the joints. So if you have strong muscles around the joint, we have less pressure on the joint. For muscle balance, we reduce stress on the body. So if you might be tight in certain muscle groups and weak in certain muscle groups, but even one side of the joint can be strong, we wanna make sure we have a balance around that. So exercise often reduces pain and inflammation. And this is where I see more mistakes than anything. Um, people said, well, I was sore from the first session or the exercise made my pain worse. Therefore, I did not do it for the rest of the week. And that's really where most people make the mistakes because the more you do it, the better the pain gets, the more you, better your motions get, the more less inflammation you get. So sometimes we got to modify it. We got to do it less intensely or less repetitions, but the more you do it, generally you do better, of course, unless there's some other um, pathology going on there that exercise would be contraindicated. And again, just like joint mobilization of it helps improve nutrients of the joint, so does exercise. And so we're improving uh, the nutrients, the, the fluidity of the joints, thereby improving overall, not just muscle health, but also joint health. Same slide, we think alike. So the, the multifidus, our muscles the, for the back pain, transverse abdominis, pelvic floor, these are muscle groups that often your typical personal trainer gym exercises aren't targeting. So sit-ups are not going to activate the transverse abdominis. So we are here to show you what you need to do to improve those muscles that, again, are not necessarily common knowledge. So Pilates type exercises or certain things. But again, every person's different, every body's different, people are in different shapes or different pain levels. We need to get you to certain levels through progressive exercise. So eventually you need to do your exercises. Um, again, a lot of people, mis people, mistakes people make is I feel better or I got the epidural eventually, pain went away, everything goes out the window, I stopped doing my exercises. Six months later, the pain's back. So this is something you don't have to do every day, but something we want you to kind of progress going forward and do on your own, or you may be back in the same position down the road. Uh, so 
my title was art and science of physical therapy art because a lot of this there's an art to the manual therapy and experience and the mobilization but there is a lot of science as we say manual therapy with exercise and science has shown it's better outcomes um four years post fusion there's no outcomes no better than conservative care in many cases physical therapy it, is as effective, not better than surgery for spinal stenosis. So spinal stenosis was that uh, arthritic narrowing of the joints, the the, uh, the foramen on the outside of the joint where the nerves are really coming out. We are trying to improve pressure by improving core strength, but also improve mobilization, rotation of the joint, thereby improve, decreasing pressure on that nerve root. Um, early intervention of physiotherapy improves outcomes more than you know doing all the medical interventions first and then coming back. So early interventions better. Research has shown physical therapy combined with conservative medical care is better than cervical intervention. Hope our surgeons aren't watching. Now, of course, there are always uh, time for surgery and we thank those surgeons when, in, when it is time for surgery. So, longitudinal study, one, two years post-surgery, the surgical patient may often be doing better, but six to eight years post-surgery, the non-surgical patient has better outcomes than the surgical patient. So I think that's the end for me. Um, we have lots of time for questions and then we can pass that back over. All right, it's a good thing we have lots of time for questions because we have 28 questions that have already come in. So I will address um, both Dr. Garala and Joe with these variety of questions. I'm going to move my screen so that I can start. Okay, I'll wait for Dr. Garala to come back on. And we're going to get a whole bunch more questions, and I will try to address them all, but I've got these 28 here in front of me. So, Joe, I'll ask you this one while we're waiting for Dr. Garala to come back. Okay. How can you tell if your back pain is muscular or nerve-related in origin? There's Dr. Garala. How can you tell if your back pain is muscular or nerve in origin? Well, pain is always nerve in origins, right? Your pain sensors are going, giving signals to brain saying that there's pain there. But if you're talking about like sciatic pain, um, there's tests to see if you're stressing the nerve that you're actually gonna increase the symptoms. Of course, the numbness and tingling or progressive weak, numbness and weakness would be a sign of nerve pain. Um, but a lot of times pain feels muscular, but it could be referred to referring from the facet joint or other structures as well. So um, if again, if you have that tingling progression of neurological signs, then it's more of a nerve pain. Dr. Garala, would you say anything else to that? Yeah, the only thing I want to add is, is usually the concern of nerve injury to the low back are the major nerve, nerve roots coming from the back, the spinal nerve roots. Um, and so usually, not all the time, but they present with symptoms traveling down the leg. It's a highway system. Um, so when someone says I have numbness and tingling in the leg, um, leg weakness, that usually gives us a clue that it's a nerve issue um, that we're dealing with. Most of it's a more localized area. Um, that makes us think a little bit more if it's a joint sort of, um, if pain is localized to the low back, it might be the lumbar facet joints or the buttock region, it might be a sick or a joint. Um, as Joe alluded in his lecture, pain can be referred. Um, and so people that have lumbar facet joints actually can have pain mimic sciatica and it refers pain to the back of their hamstring. So that's why it's very important to get an assessment um, by a provider, including a physical therapist, so they can put their hands on you, do these um, provocative tests, and get a sense um, if it's coming from a nerve or another structure of the spine. Great, thank you both. Okay, here's another question from someone. I woke up with extreme lower back pain from no obvious cause. I've been unable to sleep for two nights in a row because every position is painful, from a hard floor to a firm pillow top mattress. Muscle relaxers make me too dizzy during the day, and I fear I will fall from that side effect. What can I do to alleviate the pain and get some much needed sleep? Come in. <laughs> yes. I was thinking the same thing. I alluded to that um, in my um, topic of how back pain can occur 
spontaneously. Um, I use the cold as an analogy. You can take care of yourself, practice good hygiene, eat healthy, but the odds are you're still going to get the cold at some point in your life. That is essentially back pain, where you can eat healthy, work on um, avoiding postures that can be contributing, but odds are you're going to get back pain at some point in your life. Um, I am part of the club of people that have back pain, and the last two times I developed back pain was literally just waking up in the morning, not doing anything different with my routine. Um, so the fact that you develop back pain out of the blue is not um, out of the norm. Um, if you don't have any contraindications, a lot of the medications I usually recommend initially are anti-inflammatory medications or extra strength Tylenol. You can take them at the same time. They work at different pathways. You can also consider icing the back, um, putting heat on the back. There's no strong literature that one is better. Um, and then you can just obviously find a position of comfort. If it's still impacting your everyday um, ability to sleep, then obviously coming in for further evaluation, maybe starting a physical therapy program as well would be beneficial. Great, thank you both. All right, here's the next one. I had an L5 S1 fusion in November of 2019. My back is just as painful as it was prior to the surgery. I've since tried physical therapy and epidurals, but I'm not getting any relief or epidural shots. I have I also have very arthritic facet joints. Any suggestions for pain relief would be welcome. So I could take that as well. Um, so in particular, when people have fusions, there is a sort of principle called adjacent segment um, dysfunction. And the analogy I use is if you were to fuse a metal bar with a wooden bar and try to start bending it, the it's going to be at the junction where that it's going to be broken. Okay. So if there's hardware in your spine, it's unlikely that that area is going to be a continued source of the pain. So where we have the next levels of stress is literally the area above it or the area below it. So in your case, if you have an L5-S1 fusion, the area above it might be at the L4-5 level, including the facet joints, or it might be the level below it, including the sacroiliac joint. So a lot of it depends on where the majority of your pain is coming from, the manifestation of the pain, if it radiates down or if it's more localized. Um, as I mentioned before, there are numerous injections that can be performed. Epidural steroid injections are usually used for pain that is originating from the epidural space in the form of a disc or a pinched nerve, but it is not necessarily gonna help with pain if it is coming from a joint. So my suggestion is to be evaluated but also um, talk about would you be a candidate for injections, possibly targeting the, the areas above or below um, the fusion. And then a lot of, in our world, is you, you do manual therapy with a fusion and you're not gonna do it right post-surgery and assuming there's a solid fusion, um, what the history is at, now that you're six months, definitely a year out, I'm still not going to do the same techniques I would do on some without a fusion, but there is ways to loosen up those facet joints above and below safely, and that might be a help. And maybe the therapy you had before didn't address that issue, or it was too soon after surgery. Got it. Great. Thank you both. Is there any hope for people over 55 who have had multiple lumbar fusions to be free of pain? And then this person says, I won't take opiates. And it sounds like you both said, yeah, there's hope. We can try other things. I mean, I think, yeah, the, the manifestation. Oh, go ahead, Joe. I mean, pain free is anyone truly pain free? But I think you could, you could definitely make improvements with the manual therapy. Um, is Are you going to always have a bad day here and there? I think that could be something you have to live with, but we can definitely make some improvements. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, pain is very complex. Um, there's a lot of contributing factors, but at the end of the day, we want patients to get better as well. A lot of the principles that we talked about are traditional treatment options, um, evidence-based, but there are other complementary alternative medicine um, treatment that we just don't know enough about. So if someone wants to try acupuncture per se, um, chiropractic care, 
um, other means of trying to help with the pain, I'm all for it, even though there's not strong literature. Again, I usually would recommend traditional means in which we know a little bit more of the evidence. But if I have, am taking care of a patient that has more chronic pain, then I start evaluating other aspects of it. As I mentioned before, cognitive behavioral therapy of um, learning how that has an impact on our mind, stressors. There's so many patients that I see um, accountants that they usually get back pain around the time when tax season is or there's someone that is moving and they even admit like, I have a lot of stress. My daughter is going to college. I'm, I'm having issues at work and I'm having a lot of pain. So there is a huge mind body connection. And so taking a holistic approach of not just the physical aspects, but also the mental aspects of uh, pain is very important to address. Great, thank you. All right, next I have, what are the best sleep positions that won't create pop-up pain in the morning? Mm. Again, that's very personal, whatever works for you. It's hard to say, stay in that position all night because you can't necessarily stay in that position. But I think a general is avoid sleeping on your stomach. Um, people um, with wider hips, they put more pressure. So like a knee between the pillows lying on your side is generally a way to reduce pain. Uh, other than that, though, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a variable per person. Yeah, it depends on potentially what the underlying source of the pain is. When people typically have symptoms associated with stenosis, which is, again, narrowing, um, their pain usually manifests when their back is in an extension position. Um, so alluded to laying on their stomach or sometimes laying flat on their back. Um, because there is tension along that nerve root. So if someone is symptomatic from stenosis, sometimes what I would recommend is to sleep with pillows underneath their legs so their legs are flexed or um, sleeping a little bit more upright because you're trying to put a little bit of slack, so to speak, in, in the nerves. If it's more localized, uh, again, it's hard to tell. Um, like Joe mentioned, it's really just finding a position that you find comfortable, whether it's putting a in between your knees or whatnot. But again, it, it's sort of complex in, in regards to what the underlying source of your pain is. So do you think it might be a good idea for someone to keep track? Try it in this position one night. Keep track of how you felt. Try it in another position another night and just sort of keep track for your own individual body's preference. Absolutely. I, I mean, and if it, it means eventually that you come in to be evaluated, that information is very powerful and useful. Um, part of the history taking is what, what do you do that helps alleviate the pain? Um, because then that could give us an idea that if it's more a flexion based posture, then we're looking at things that, um, that may be the facet joints or stenosis, which again, usually are more painful with extension base. Um, or if they say, hey, I have more pain in a flex position, then we're, maybe it's a disc issue. So any sort of um, note taking or um, just of how the pain manifests will be very helpful from evaluation from a doctor's point as well as a physical therapy standpoint. Great. Thank you. What is the percentage of improvement of back pain after receiving an injection? Um, so that's a very loaded question. Yeah, it is. It actually depends on the type of injection that has been performed. Um, when we talk about epidural steroid injections, the most favorable response is for people that have um, a herniated disc because a herniated disc is tissue. Um, even though epidural steroid injections have been proven to help with um, conditions like lumbar stenosis, um, it's more favorable for people that have soft tissues that are causing the herniated disc. There are also um, good literature in regards to a condition or a procedure called radiofrequency ablation, which I didn't get into too much detail. Um, but if the pain is um, found to be coming from the of the spine, there's a special type of procedure that can be provide longer lasting um, pain relief. So it really depends on the underlying source of your pain um, and sort of what is the most contributing um, factor to it um, to really determine the prognosis from an intervention. Great, thank you. 
All right, this person says low back pain often found in long distance runners as a form of repetitive use injury. I've had this for over a year. How do I get rid of the pain while continuing to run? Again, that would probably require an evaluation, but long distance runners often have, are in mass, great shape, but they're weak in certain muscles. Could be their hip abductors, it could be certain core stabilizers that are weak in, that they just need to get some muscle balance and, and tuned up. Or it could be degeneration and some things need to be just loosened up as well. So this next one is, are home use e-stim treatments safe to use? They're extremely safe, but they're not necessarily effective. Um, it's basically the same thing as putting on some Bengay, just taking away the sensation, tricking your brain into it. Now, with electrical stimulation, though, you get this accommodation where your nervous system gets used to it. So there are certain devices out there that are better, that have variable frequency and wavelength and amplitude. Um, if it keeps your pain meds down, you know, I'm all for it, but at the same time, it's not going to fix anything. And, and it's just kind of putting like a same thing as like rubbing your your hurting spot for a little bit. Okay, okay. And the next question is, is it beneficial to take medicine while still doing physical therapy? The issue is not pain, the issue is whether medicine will help in the curing process. So I think that's their question, will the medicine help? I believe it, um, when we're talking about, again, pain, usually not all the time, a contributing factor is possibly inflammation, whether it's inflammation of the nerve, the joints, et cetera. So if you don't have any contraindications, the way I look at it is we're trying to tackle this at as many angles as possible. And the first line of treatment is usually in the form of medications as, as well as physical therapy. Um, so I typically encourage my patients to um, do both at the same time, um, as long as they're tolerable. Great, any, any more comments for that, Joe? No, I agree. I mean. If, if the medication helps you do the exercises better and get you out of that pain cycle, then therapy can be even more beneficial. Great, thank you. Can you explain how physical therapy works virtually? Do you, does one need to have a camera available? Yes, virtually, I mean, during the peak of the pandemic, I was doing some uh, tele, telemedicine. You need the camera. Um, it was more beneficial than I expected. Um, we can't palpate, we can't feel for joint positions or stiffness, but if we can get a feel based on this looking at posture, range of motion, getting a person started with some exercises is definitely better than nothing at all. Great, thank you. Uh, this person says they have scoliosis. Do you treat people with scoliosis and do you think your treatment would be beneficial for that, for that type of, for pain that would be, I guess, coming from having scoliosis? I mean, go ahead. <laughs> scoliosis could be like juvenile scoliosis, um, and there's specialists like in scroth therapy that can be very beneficial in improving the scoliosis. Now, if you're talking like adult onset scoliosis or this minor scoliosis you've had your whole life, now you're getting older, um, again, strengthening, balancing the muscles can have a significant impact, I've found. Great, so great, that's wonderful, thank you. All right, let's see. Um, someone said that uh, they appreciate the humor that you put in. They actually got it because they've, they've uh, addressed things with their own physical therapist, so thank you for that. Um, okay, this person says they've gone through several episodes of physical therapy for back pain with no real improvements. Here's the all imposing question, why? <laughs> so I'll, I'll start off. Um, I really think it's important on where you go for physical therapy. Um, as a physiatrist, I wholeheartedly believe in therapy. I recommend physical therapy for almost all of my patients. But just like doctors are generally trained in general conditions and then we specialize, I'm not the person that you should be seeing for heart issues, okay? And most physical therapists are going to be trained on spine neck pain, back pain, because it's one of the most common referrals for physical therapists. But me personally, I think it makes a huge difference to refer patients to um, physical therapists that have additional training, knowledge in pain neuroscience education, have um, additional training and certificate, 
So what I try to do is develop a good network of physical therapists that um, hopefully will get them better, but if anything else, does a great job of educating the patients. So um, I, I do believe it, it really depends on where you, but also therapists are trained in different techniques. There are physical therapists that specialize in um, conditional McKenzie type exercises, um, and there's different philosophies as well. So just because you fail one type of physical therapy program doesn't necessarily mean that you'll fail um, in all of them. I agree with that. Great. Yeah, good, good. Okay, great, thank you. Someone else asks, how long should physical therapy last? That really depends on the condition. Um, I definitely have seen it go on too long. Um, six weeks is generally a solid, we can, we're can we gonna know if we're gonna make some improvements um, at that point, if not sooner. Doesn't always have to be two, three times a week for six weeks. Often I, my people will come back every, once a week, every two to three weeks, just for a recheck for manual therapy adjustment and then maybe a little home exercise progression. So it kind of depends on the person and what their needs are. Okay, the next question is, is it safe to do physical therapy at this time with COVID happening around us? I mean, nothing's 100% safe right now, right? But uh, you know, we're wearing masks, I'm putting gloves on, we're cleaning, they're cleaning everything constantly. Um, uh, not, there's not been an incident in the Glenview Clinic yet. Um, hopefully there's no incident coming forward. Um, I'm very comfortable with it. I mean, I've been doing this for, since the COVID started, never stopped treating. and. I am, myself and my family are safe, so that's all I can say about it. Great, great. I think it also just depends on your comfort level. Um, obviously, people that are older and are immunocompromised, um, you know, may, I can understand that they're hesitant to go um, to the physical therapy location. Um, so really, it just depends on your preference. Obviously, all therapy locations are usually doing what they can um, to ensure your, your safety. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a huge, in my opinion, of doing inpatient or in-person physical therapy than via telemedicine, because what Joe alluded to, they can actually put their hands on you, notice a little bit of uh, irregularities in regards to your posture, um, your biomechanics. Um, sometimes I say, you know, if they're hesitant, maybe try, if possible, to go in for a few sessions um, in person and then talk about transitioning to a telemedicine or home program. Very good. Great, great, thank you. The, another person asks, can an e inversion table help or hinder some back pain? You know, I'm not a big fan of inversion tables. Um, you know, the way I look at it is we wanna give practical treatment for, for patients that are long lasting of all my patients, but at the end of the day, I don't want them to keep on seeing me. I don't want them to keep on seeing Joe. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to do is empower them to do exercises on their own. Now, there are certain things like inversion tables, cer cer uh, cervical traction um, machines that then make them feel better. Um, but then it, it's almost like they have to repetitively do that on a daily basis and they have this short period of relief. So unless you plan on staying in that inversion table for a very prolonged period of time, um, you know, it's not shown any long lasting effects on the spine or, you know, sometimes the neck with cervical traction. I would say it's a, it's a decent option, but at the same time, it's not the only thing. You can't fix you. So you got to do it with conjunction with other things. Mostly Great. Thank you. Um, it's 4.29, I'm wondering, should we wrap it up here? Do you wanna take a couple more questions? Actually, here's one that, I, if you don't mind, I'll give you one more. Could you please recommend some good back exercises, particularly those that will reverse a curved spine or herniated disc? Is there a place that people can go to to find some good exercises in general that people use for their backs, or should they be coming in and seeing a physical therapist or a personal trainer to, to, to get exercises, to learn, to understand, to do exercises to help their backs? I mean, both, yes. I mean, 
is there one good place? I can't say there's one good place. YouTube has plenty of videos on how to do this, and these are some good exercises. Uh, well, what's good for one is not good for everyone. So if anything's, if you follow that and it's making things worse, make sure you stop right away. You might need to do some things. Some things might be too hard for you. You might be doing it wrong. So always better to get some kind of guidance. And it doesn't have to be 18 visits. It could be four visits. And just learn some exercises and then continue yeah, to practice those. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I want to preface too, like it, it, like Joe alluded to, it, it's really important to get a good assessment because even in with the what the question asked about bulging disc or herniated disc, also depends on where exactly that disc is herniated. Most common, it's more paracentrally, and the theory is uh, an extension-based exercise can help with that. But sometimes herniated disc can be more in the foramen. And actually, an extension-based exercise will actually make pain worse. Right. Um, right. So even though it's a, a herniated disc, in one instance, it can be beneficial to do extension-based, and it can be harmful. So it's very difficult, again, to just say do extension-based. But what Joe um, stated, if you start doing exercises and you feel like it's made pain worse, um, to scale things back and then maybe get reevaluated. Great, great. Thank you very much. Uh, do you do either of you have any final comments you would like to share with people? The only thing that I would like to add is um, I know with COVID-19, it's been crazy for everyone. But before uh, the pandemic hit, we instituted um, a back to life clinic um, program at um, our Glenview office in Illinois Bone and Joint. And the, the point was to provide comprehensive care immediately. So people that have acute back pain within 24 to 48 hours can come to our office, uh, be seen um, usually by myself or another spine specialist, um, provide x-rays if necessary, prescribe medications, and then get them in almost immediately to uh, a spine physical therapist at our Glenview office. So the whole initiative was to provide comprehensive care basically in the same day. Obviously, COVID-19 has sort of put a wrench into things um, in regards to our schedule, but hopefully when things get back to normal, um, we'll pick back up um, from the preliminary responses that we've gotten from patients um, that have come back in. It's been very favorable. So it's just something to keep in mind instead of going to the emergency room or an urgent care or even your primary care physician, um, our Back to Life Clinic at Illinois Bone and Joint is there to help anyone with acute pain. That's great. And that is still open and functioning during COVID-19? It is, yes. Fantastic. For All the right. most part, it is, yeah. Great, great. And is that the Ravine Way address or is that a different address? That's the Ravine it's Way. It's at the Ravine Way. It's at the Ravine Way. Terrific. So that's what's up on the screen, everyone. So if you um, are interested in getting to the Back to Life Clinic, um, you can, well, you can also contact Dr. Garala or Joe and, and get some more information. but. Um, but you can look it up on the Illinois Bone and Joints Institute's website, and you'll be able to find the Back to Life Clinic there, I'm sure, too, and find out how to make an appointment to get in and see one of the specialists there. Dr. Garala, Joe, thank you both very, very much for joining us today. Thank you for answering all the questions, taking the extra time to, to answer so many questions. Thank you for the great information and all the effort you put in. I wanted to let everyone know, too, that Illinois Bone and Joint is doing programs with the North Suburban YMCA monthly. And um, so I want to let you know that the next program that we're doing cooperatively is called Neurology and Concussion Management with Dr. Anthony Savino. And that will be Tuesday, August 25th at 7 p.m. So keep an eye out for that. And we've gotten a lot of questions. Has this program been recorded and will it be put out there? And yes, it will, both on the Illinois Bone and Joint website and on the North Suburban YMCA's website. So thank you all very much for coming today. Thank you again to our wonderful presenters, and we hope to see you again next month. Thank you.